Imagine that you open the newspaper one morning and you see a headline, Padres smash diamondbacks. Sounds like a bunch of priests have killed a bunch of snakes, right? Then you realize you're looking at the sports section. Oh yeah, the San Diego Padres baseball team defeated the Arizona Diamondbacks baseball team. Context is everything, and here the context is the world of professional baseball. Taken out of that context, the phrase Padres smash Diamondbacks could easily be misinterpreted. In a similar way, if someone reads and tries to interpret Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address without knowing English, or about American history, or the Civil War, or Abraham Lincoln himself, chances are, whatever interpretation she arrives at, whatever she thinks Lincoln meant, her interpretation of the address will probably not be very accurate. In our time, when we read and interpret a saying or a story found in the Bible, we usually do a good job of placing that saying or story in its original context in order to understand the meaning. When we read and attempt to interpret a New Testament book, such as the Gospel of Mark, for example, we try to know as much as we can about the context in which it was written. That means learning about its language, Greek, the culture in which the author lived, the different types of literature then in use, the intended audience, and so on. But as biblical scholar Ched Myers has pointed out, very often the political context of New Testament writings is overlooked and that political context matters. Here is an example of how and why that political context is also significant. Jesus has just crossed the Sea of Galilee after having cured a paralytic in the synagogue at Capernaum. In Jesus' day, Judea was under Roman domination. Life was miserable for most ordinary folks, but many members of the Jewish elite had made arrangements with the Roman enemy, so in effect, political and economic power was shared by Jewish authorities and Roman governors. Healing in a synagogue suggests that there, on the turf of Jewish authorities, such as scribes and Pharisees, there is disease. So Jesus acts. He heals and forgives sin in the synagogue on a Sabbath and causes a lot of controversy. The ordinary folks there are delighted, but the scribes in charge of the synagogue are angered. Now, Jesus leaves Jewish territory and he travels across the sea to the land of the Gerasenes, Gentile territory. Immediately, he is confronted by a demon. Jesus immediately meets a poor man who was possessed by an unclean spirit living among the tombs there, and there are pigs nearby. For Jews, such a place is doubly impure because contact with either a dead body or a pig makes a Jew ritually impure. The very mention of this graveyard in Gerasa would remind the readers of Mark of an event that took place there not long before Mark composed this gospel. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, before he was emperor, Vespasian was a general fighting against Jewish rebels. At that time, he sent some of his troops to Gerasa, where they massacred a thousand young men, took women and children captive, and burned the town to the ground. It was a tragedy people could not forget. If you're an American, think 9-11. Mark is certainly aware of this. As we shall see, as the story of the man possessed by the demon unfolds, there are several allusions to this tragic event. So, Jesus goes to an impure place, Gentile, dead bodies, pigs, and he confronts a demon who has made a poor man's life miserable. The possessed man has been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any longer not even with chains. He was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and prostrated himself before Jesus. Jesus ordered, Unclean spirit, come out of this man. The unclean spirit cried out in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Note that the demon addresses Jesus with a Gentile title, Son of the Most High. Jesus then demanded, What is your name? And he replied, Legion is my name. There are many of us. And he pleaded earnestly with Jesus not to drive them away from that territory. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, so the legion of demons pleaded with Jesus 
Send us into the swine. Let us enter them. Jesus granted their wish and dismissed them. And the unclean spirits came out of the man and entered the swine. The herd of about two thousand pigs rushed down a steep bank into the sea where they were drowned. Jesus confronts a legion. In the time of Jesus and Mark, the word legion had only one meaning, a division of Roman soldiers, usually two thousand men. And the demons enter a herd of pigs. The word for herd, agali in Greek, is really inappropriate here because pigs do not travel in herds. Mark uses the word because it has military overtones. Herd, agali, was often used to refer to a band of military recruits. And yet another military term appears here. Jesus dismisses the unclean spirits and allows them to enter the swine. Finally, the pigs rush into the sea and are drowned. The enemy soldiers rush into the sea and are swallowed up by hostile waters. Perhaps that might make you think of something in the Old Testament. It might make you think of Israel's liberation from Egypt when Pharaoh's army was pursuing Moses and his people and that army was swallowed up by the sea. Liberation. The swineherds ran away and reported the incident in the local town and throughout the countryside and many people came out to see what had happened. As they approached Jesus, they caught sight of the man who had been possessed by a legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were seized with fear. Those who witnessed the incident explained to them what had happened to the possessed man and to the swine. Then the people began to beg Jesus to leave their district. Note that it would make sense for the local people to beg Jesus to leave. They were well aware of the Roman scorched earth policy, their habit of returning at a later date to the site of a defeat and killing and destroying everything in sight. That had actually happened there at Garasa. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed pleaded to remain with Jesus, but he would not permit him, but told him instead, Go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. Then the man went off and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him. Everyone was amazed. If you read the Old and New Testaments carefully, you will discover that the books they contain are written not by the rich and powerful, but by the lowly, poor, and weak. The Bible stands on the side of the oppressed, the poor, and the excluded, who often become society's scapegoats. The Bible expresses the perspective of those at the bottom, those society considers, if not losers, then at least marginal people. Jewish and Christian writers knew oppression and persecution from experience. And almost without exception, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the oppressors, the enemies of God's people, are the empires of the world. Think about it. God's people are oppressed by Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Philistine, Assyrian, Babylonian, and the Roman empires, to name a few. Like the Gospel of Mark and many other books of the Bible, the book of Revelation will later take up the same theme. Empires are demonic. They are the tool of Satan. Empires trample on the weak to enrich the few. It was true then, and it remains true today. Recall the very first words Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel, the good news. The word gospel, good news, is another military term Mark uses. The Greek word euagelion was the term used for the good news of a military conquest that a messenger would bring back to an emperor or king. Perhaps this is why Mark called his message gospel, good news. It's a message about a wartime victory, the victory of God's empire over Satan's empires, the empires of this world. Jesus is victorious. The battle for the liberation of the poor and the oppressed has been won. No wonder early Christians gave to Jesus all the titles that had been given to world emperors, titles such as Son of God and Lord and Prince of Peace. No wonder the religious and political authorities considered Jesus a threat. No wonder the indictment that hung over Jesus' head on the cross read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. 
In the very beginning of Mark's Gospel, soon after announcing the inauguration of the kingdom or empire of God, Jesus confronts the Jewish ruling class, the elite which had aligned itself with the Roman oppressors. He confronts them on the scribes' own turf, the synagogue at Capernaum, where he forgives sin and heals paralysis. And then in Gerasa, Jesus confronts the other half of the colonial power oppressing the poor, Roman military power, represented by the legion of demons. In these narratives and in others, we can see how Jesus challenged the powers that be, how he repudiated the political and ideological authority of both the Jewish scribal establishment and the Roman military garrison. Ultimately, they will seek to destroy him. And when they do, Jesus will voluntarily offer himself up to them as a scapegoat, refusing to imitate their hatred and their murderous behavior.